Good evening, and I'd like to call to order the October 9th, 2023 meeting of the East Penn School District Board of School Directors. If you now please rise and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, it gives me great pleasure to move to our next item of business on tonight's agenda, which is a, a matter of student recognition. This is always one of the highlights of any meeting. This time we're going to talk about our 2024 National Merit Scholarship semifinalist and commended students. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Campbell. Do you want to join sure. Me? Yes, good evening. I have to be honest, we don't always draw such an impressive crowd for our board meetings, so it really is fantastic to see so many great guests with us. Um, I want to start off by giving a little bit of background on the National Merit Scholarship Program, which is something that I think many in our audience and our school community are familiar with. Annually, 1.3 million juniors in about over 21,000 high schools entered the 2024 National Merit Scholarship Program by taking the PSAT, or the Preliminary SAT. The nationwide pool of semifinalists represents less than 1% of US high school seniors, including the highest scoring entrants from each state. This evening, we're so very proud to have one National Merit Sch Scholar semifinalist and this individual, and I invite him to come up and receive his recognition, is Benjamin Wiese. <laughs> ben, while you stand here, I have a few more great words about you. Ben was named along with approximately 16,000 semifinalists across the country. He is one of only a few academically talented high school seniors who now has an opportunity to continue on in the competition for scholarships that total nearly $28 million that will be offered this spring. So we will continue to watch you and your progress, and again, are incredibly proud of your accomplishments, not only with the National Merit Scholarship Program, but really just in terms of your outstanding academic and scholarly accomplishments at Emmaus High School. Congratulations. And I believe we also have Mrs. Gariello, who's here, who's going to help to hand out some certificates as well. The National Merit Scholarship Program also recognizes 34,000 commended students across the country. And we are so very proud of the fact that we have 15 Emmaus High School students who received letters of commendation in, rec in recognition of their outstanding accomplishments, again, on the PSAT. Many of these candidates are also considered for special scholarships provided by corporate and business sponsors. And again, we'd like to take some time this evening to, rec to recognize these students for their outstanding accomplishments as well. If you could please come forward and receive your award from either Mrs. Gariello or Dr. Levinson. The first individual is Aiden Arakel. Oh. Ryan Begg. Madison Carrero. Congratulations. 
This is good practice for graduation, by the way, the handshakes and... Elijah Daly, unfortunately, is not able to join us this evening, but we'll recognize Elijah. <laughs> Kay Kayla DiGiacomo. <laughs> Aiden Doyle. Tyler Fink, also unable to join us this evening. <laughs> Chase Gravero. <laughs> Jeremy Lamb. Ugana Natamala. Unfortunately, I believe Ugana is, is not well, but she has her mom and dad who are here to receive the award, so we welcome them to come. <laughs> Thomas Sizelove. Sarvesh Sengudavan. Henry Stewart. Angela Tran. And Hugh Wilkes. I have to say, this is quite an amazing class, and this is um, an, a significant accomplishment for so very many students. And so again, we're so very proud of you for your outstanding accomplishments. I also want to take a moment to recognize family members who are here in the audience. We in education recommend that the amazing work that happens with your students every day could not be possible without your support at home. And so we appreciate your collaboration and partnership as, as part of your child's educational journey here in the district. And thanks for letting us share just a little part of that journey. So again, thank you. Congratulations to all of our students. I'm going to ask you to probably gather so we can get a picture. So to those students and families uh, who were just honored, uh, you're more than welcome to stay for the meeting, but if you would like to uh, uh, go home and maybe do a little homework or whatnot, you're welcome to do so, and we, I can give you a, a minute or two to, to clear out just before we, we go move on. But thank you very much, and congratulations to you all. <laughs> Interesting. They could just 
score is a commended student or a semifinalist, but they can't line up for a pick. Katie's better. Well, you know, she's paying a lot, too. <laughs> <clears throat> I cleared out. Wow. Okay, I think we can move on. Next item on the agenda, our request to address the board. We have several tonight, uh, but before we get to those, I wanna read the following statement. Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with public comment, speakers should feel free to express their opinion, <coughs> comment, or question, and understand that this is not an interactive engagement with the board or with the administration. Please direct your comments to the chair. Be respectful, not engage in profane rhetoric, and be mindful that others, including students, may be listening. I would request that you consider that protocol when making your comments. For the members of the audience, please also be respectful and refrain from speaking during the public comment period. Uh, with that, I will now announce each speaker and their topic. When you step up to the podium, again, state your name, and you will have three minutes within which to speak, and I will give you a 30-second warning uh, to when your time is up. Our first speaker tonight is uh, Ms. Andrea Roth, who's here to talk tonight about security and bullying. Good evening, I'm Andrea Roth. I have two topics I would like to discuss. First and foremost, everyone is aware of our changing times in society and in our schools regarding genders, pronouns, and the increasing use of social media, just to name a few. However, bullying in schools has always been an issue and continues to escalate according to our children and their peers. It is apparent that the teacher's hands are tied while our children become more concerned for their safety and scared to attend school. In many cases, bullies continue to be in the same class as their victims, showing our children that there is little to no consequences of being a bully. This brings me to my second topic, security within our schools. This issue is not only for our children, but for our teachers, support staff, and even the children who exhibit the negative behavior themselves. I want my child to be able to walk the halls of her proud middle school without a fight breaking out, which isn't stopped due to repercussions on teachers and students. Words being used to undermine, put down, and traumatize students by their peers. Sexual innuendos, verbal threats, and physical attacks on our children from other students are happening in some capacity daily. These are not issues that anyone in this room or community take lightly. However, they continue to be an escalating issue for our children. I feel that being a part of the solution is the only way we will be successful and a positive outcome for our children. The money the district spends on surveys to identify emotional needs, social inclusivity, et cetera, could be spent on student staff support, security, and other measures, increasing safety within our school walls. Maybe this board can collectively find money for metal detectors, increased adult hallway supervision, and more in-house support staff to de-escalate issues before they become out of control. This is not just to support the victims, but helping violators the same. Isn't the continued reporting of bullying, fighting, and horrendous behaviors enough evidence to show this board the issues of our children face without surveys? Which leads me to the mental health struggles of our students. I am proud that East Penn School District joined the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's mission to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. This past Sunday, my family and I raised money and awareness for our community through the Out of the Darkness Walk. I challenge this board to find added resources within local hospitals and mental health organizations to build partnerships with these institutions. I am proposing to have more of these resources within the school walls, helping on the day-to-day -day struggles. We need to think outside the box to create pathways for integration of outside support to fill these continuous daily voids for our children. Has the district considered partnership with local organizations to have psychology students, psychiatry residents, therapists in training to do part of the residency rotation within our schools, maximizing our ability to reach more students, preventing future threats. We need to work together to show our commitment to our school communities and help our children reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roth.
Our next speaker is Ms. Gab Klotz, uh, here to talk about school discipline and fighting. So my name is Gabrielle Klotz. I'm here tonight as a parent of a current East Penn student. To the board and the administration, thank you for what you do. You are appreciated. I'm happy to see an increase in both school board meeting attendance and public comments at the school board meetings. Of course, the meeting attendance tonight was really for student recognition, but regardless, an engaged community is a powerful com community. That being said, please keep in mind that people can say whatever they like during public comments. There is neither fact-checking fact nor immediate public response from the board. Administration and the board also cannot speak to situations involving specific students due to privacy concerns. I suggest you fact-check even seemingly reasonable statements. First, I'm addressing the perception of an administration and board complacent with fighting in our schools. Let's be frank here. In an ideal world, our schools would not have fights. In an ideal world, there would be no fighting anywhere. We do not live in an ideal world, and East Penn is firmly based in reality. Like every school district, we do have children who struggle. Some people will have you believe that East Penn administration and the board have turned a blind eye to fighting in our schools and that our district is an undisciplined free-for-all for students. This is simply not true. East Penn has done the following and more to prevent fighting and address fighting throughout the district. They have hired behavior interventionists, hired student deans, who are individuals who only deal with behavior infractions. They have added equipment, such as vaping detectors that also detect trouble. They have therapy dogs, there was a $400,000 allocation for the 23-24 school year for safety and security. There's an SRO at the high school. In LMMS specifically, administrators tar targeted students with frequent infractions and assigned them a staff member to check in with them at the start and the end of every day. These are actions of an administration and board that cares about the students and the community. East Penn wants all of our children and school personnel to have a safe environment. The information that I stated is publicly available. We need to give the, me the measures taken by administration and the board time to work. Lastly, seconds. some people are loudly sharing their low opinion of our district. I disagree with that opinion. I love East Penn and am still realistic about it. Rarely is something 100% good or bad. Fighting is something that school districts around the country are trying to figure out, and the problem is not unique to East Penn. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Klotz. Our next speaker tonight is Ms. Stephanie Rafes, here to talk about thanking the board and voicing concerns about potential charges to the district. Potential changes. Oh, I'm sorry. Potential changes. <laughs> that, 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 that's a little different. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Steph Rafis, and I live in Lower Mukunji Township. In 2020, a dream came true, and I was blessed and fortunate enough to purchase my first home. As many of us are aware, even if you don't have kids, living in a good school district can increase your home's value over time. I specifically chose to purchase in East Penn because of the excellent school district. If you search Lehigh Valley message boards, you will see the same two districts mentioned over and over as top choices. East Penn, of course, is one of the two. We have a suburban, family-friendly appeal, great parks, safe neighborhoods, and a close-knit community. After months of searching in a crazy market, I finally found the home I'd been hoping for in East Penn. I'm speaking tonight for two reasons. The first is to commend the board for their time, attention, and hard work to keep the district's excellent reputation intact. I'm happy to know that the district addresses the educational needs of all students in a safe and supportive environment. The second reason I'm speaking is because I am concerned. We've seen some alarming trends over the last couple of years, spe specifically where public education is concerned. 
The election next month could drastically change the makeup of this board. No matter who wins, I hope that the district will continue to allow students to remain safe from discrimination based on gender identity, race, religion, or sexual orientation, to provide proper mental health support, to listen to parents and remain transparent as to what children are learning, to allow parents to easily engage with their specific school sites and administrators, to allow students to have the freedom to learn about all cultures, religions, and ways of life in an age-appropriate manner without censorship, to allow students the freedom to express themselves authentically without fear of punishment or discrimination, to promote a culture of anti-bullying and conflict resolution, to ensure that we are properly funded to offer a wide range of programs and resources to meet the needs of all students, to ensure that students have opportunities to develop skills and help them thrive after graduation. And I'd like to stress the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which has become a point of contention for some. Here is the definition our district provides. Equity in education means that opportunities are differentiated to ensure all students have access to the resources, programs, and experiences they need to feel safe and supported. In East Penn, we believe in removing barriers, barriers to learning and commit to fairly distributing access, opportunity, and participation. I think we can all agree with putting students over politics. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. Our next speaker is Ms. Barbara Tenteros, here to talk about YouTube board meetings and Code 109. Good evening. Um, my name is Barbara Tanteris. I live in Emmaus and have done so for 25 years and been observing these meetings for over six years. I have two topics that I'd like to mention. The first one being at our last board meeting in September, um, Superintendent Campbell suggested that the videos of the school board meetings that are live streamed on the YouTube channel only contain highlights of the meetings. Her reasoning being that parents are very busy and therefore do not have time to either come to a meeting or watch them online. For a board that professes transparency, this is not transparency. It is editing. And we do not need editing of these meetings. We need transparency and our community would demand it from our East Penn School Board. The second topic would be Code 109 that has been developed in draft form regarding resource materials, nonfiction, fiction, magazines, reference books, media, digital materials, etc. Section 3 of the guideline draft states that the materials will stimulate growth in factual knowledge, literacy appreciation, and societal standards. And I question whose societal standards? The responsibility of delegating this would fall on the superintendent or a designee to establish administrative regulations. Many questions arise when allowing only one person to who either she or she, he or she appoints to decide on which vast level of societal standards and controversial materials to find its way into our schools. <clears throat> Just a few weeks ago, Superintendents in neighboring schools were alerted to a book circulating at the Scholastic Book Fair that contained some sexually explicit language as well as undertones of suicide, cutting, and depression. I applaud the administrator for reviewing the materials and deciding that if a parent wanted their child to purchase a review, the parent could sign out the book or purchase, but that it would not be displayed or promoted by the school. I thought surely our district will have a process for having access to sexually explicit content or content that largely would be considered not suitable for everybody's child. I mean, parental discretion is needed to take a child to a movie. So therefore, the books that these other seconds. districts choose to identify as not suitable, I'm sure our school board could do the same. I believe the board should be involved with reviewing materials or in the like, like our neighboring districts did. 
or have a committee that reviews materials on societal standards and controversial issues. They are, the board is the guard of the children. And I would hope that the whole board or a committee made up of professionals and parents would have the decisions as to what books are in our schools. Right, Thank your, you. Your time's up. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker tonight is Mr. Matthew Mull on library resources. Good evening. <clears throat> I've come before the board tonight as certain people have led a coordinated effort to spread fear, lies, intimidation to influence the upcoming election to fill the five seats for the East Bend School Board this November. While there has been a wide range of misleading topics that have been spread, I personally have tried to keep the focus on actual issues and not straw man arguments. However, one that I want to address directly tonight is the accusation that I intend to ban books. I have addressed this on numerous occasions in person and through the media. I challenge anyone to point out a time and place that I have called for the outright banning of books. They cannot because it is a lie. Nor is there a dog whistle, a vague term used when actual facts cannot be produced. I have consistently stood firm that I believe that a process should be in place where the professional librarians, teachers, community, and administration have input and decide what books are appropriate for our school libraries. This fall, the East Bend School Board did just that and I vocally supported that policy when asked in a recent article that came out about this current race. While I do not always agree with every decision the board has made, they did the right thing in filling this gap in the district's policy. There is a famous quote by Lenin, Vladimir, not John, that says, a lie told often enough becomes truth. And the people that keep repeating this accusation are hoping for just that, banking on the hope that by trying to, et to equate myself to those that want to ban books, the lie becomes truth. Make no mistake, such people do exist as we have seen in other school boards, both locally and across the nation. I am not one of them. In the ever-increasing pace of information, it is easy to get overly overwhelmed by overly simplistic black and white messaging of any kind, and we often do not have the time to do our own independent verification. I ask my fellow residents of East Penn this. Is the person spreading such blatant falsehoods as this wrong, if they are wrong? What other false narratives are they peddling? What are they trying to hide by creating a non-existent issue? Are their own motivations so empty that they need to create a distraction? Are they so afraid for calls for transparency and making the district truly inclusive of all points of view that they need to repeat these falsehoods? If you hear it from an anonymous source such as Facebook or some other social media website, why are they hiding behind uh, being anonymous? If they're saying it themselves, ask them this simple question. Have they actually spoken to me? Or are they just creating a boogeyman to further divide us? I personally have great love and respect for our community. I've had three children proudly graduate from Emmaus in a variety of extra activities, And they've all gone on to be quite successful. I think they deserve and the rest of the citizens deserve to hear the truth. There is a reason hearsay is not admissible in a court of law and it shouldn't have a place in a fair and open democracy. We need to raise the level of civil discourse, not reduce it to childish mudslinging. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mall. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Laurie McFarland uh, to talk about school performance. Where did all the kids go? I'm here to talk about them. My name is Lori McFarland, and I live at 3551 Daylily Drive in Emmaus. I'm here as a resident, a parent, and soon to be grandparent. I wear many hats in this community. In particular, I'm a retired public school teacher, so you can understand why I believe public education is one of our most important responsibilities and commitments we have to our community. And while we certainly are entitled to our own opinions, we are not entitled to our own facts. So what are the facts? 
According to U.S. News and World Report's 2324 ranking, they looked at 600 high schools in Pennsylvania and 17,000 schools nationally. Schools are ranked on their performance on state required tests, graduation, and how well they are prepared for, as students for college. Methodology for U.S. News and World Report's ranking is available online. Overall, Emmaus rank, School is ranked 160th out of 600 in Pennsylvania. Students have the opportunity to take advanced placement coursework and exams. The AP participation rate in Emmaus High School is 31%. The national average is 23. We enjoy 76% mathematics proficiency, 80% reading proficiency, and 73% science proficiency. Nationally, Emmaus High School is ranked 3,828 3, out of 17,000. Congratulations. In addition, the school district has a 94% attendance rate, a 93% graduation rate, 112 graduates earned over 4.0 GPA, which is one in seven students, 181 graduates with honors, $2.184 million in scholarships, and classroom ratios are 16 to one. What I wouldn't have given for that three years ago. There are some who say that East Penn School District is not performing well and that our elementary students are failing the standardized math tests. This is false. They compare math test scores from 2012 to 2018. But in 2013, Pennsylvania made the math tests significantly more challenging. Math test scores statewide, including East Penn's, declined after this change. Let's seconds. fast forward to 2021. East Penn math scores ranked third in Lehigh County out of 17 school districts, ranked in the top 20%. In Pennsylvania and can use to exceed national averages. And I just want to make one more, if you'll please indulge me, I want to make one more mes uh, mention about the targeted supporting improvement plan that you have for Lower McCungie Middle School. It is a subgroup um, that has triggered the improvement plan, which includes the economically disadvantaged group. Skewing standardized test results to paint the entire school and district as needing improvement is another false way to misrepresent the district. In closing, you see our school district performs at high levels, both academically and in, in extracurricular activities. Families move into our district for the outstanding education Putting out misinformation and fearful rhetoric could lead to an exodus of families leaving the district fiscally at risk and could lower property values. Why would anyone want to paint our district in a negative light when the facts clearly indicate otherwise? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McFarland. Our final requester tonight is Ms. Shanta Ford, uh, here to talk tonight about extracurricular activities in East Penn. Good evening. Move that up a little bit. I have on heels tonight. Um, Shanta Ford, and I am a resident in West Coastville. And I did just want to talk a little bit about extracurricular activities. Um, there's been a lot of talk here tonight and over the past uh, weeks and months about what's happening in schools, um, whether it's concerns about safety academics, and the like. Um, I wanted to talk about something really positive for East Penn, and that's the myriad of activities that our students get to participate in. Um, I know firsthand, because I had a student who was in the East Penn School District, and it was here that my daughter had the opportunity to learn how to snowboard, um, which is something that I don't think you get everywhere. Uh, there are a lot of clubs that she participated in, everything from the mud club um, to learning Spanish and so many others that at one point I remember asking her like, well, how many clubs are you in? Um, I think it's important to remember that every student may not be a straight A student or may not have the 4.0 GPA, but they can discover where their gifting lies through groups. 
Um, it's also another opportunity for our students to have social exposure outside of the classroom. And as we know, in this environment, um, our kids need to be able to better socialize together. Uh, the internet pulls them away from a lot of one-on-one -on -one activities and the school district provides opportunities for them actually to talk to one another, to find common things that they like to do. Um, I still use the bowl and cup that my daughter made in Mud Club. Um, I think I pulled up the list just looking at the high school at some of the offerings and it's amazing to me. From everything and it's in alphabetical order from the Activism Club, the Vedum Club, the American and Computer and Science League, the American Red Cross Club, Arts Club, the Astronomy Club, the Band Club, the Biology Club, the Black Student Union, the Gay and Straight Alliance, the Buzz Magazine, um, the Chess Club. I mean, it goes on and on and on. There's something for everyone. I also think about the opportunities uh, for, for the choir. Uh, my daughter also participated in that. They get to travel um, as well as sports activities. And so there's so many opportunities that our students are exposed to that if we lose sight of the opportunity, I think we're um, doing them a disservice. We do want to always stress academic excellence, but Let's look at it from a holistic approach. It takes so much more to have a well-rounded student. And the activities that are provided in the East Penn School District are stellar. And I just wanted to recognize that. And hopefully that continues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. OK. Well, that was our final requester. Uh, we're now going to move on in the agenda to the approval of minutes for the September 11th, uh, 2023 board meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Allen, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Seven <clears throat> ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Next item is the district update. Dr. Campbell. Good evening. I, um, as always, appreciate all the community input as well that we received through our public comments. I just want to start off by um, thanking our East Penn Education Foundation. Just recently, they hosted their third annual foundation golf outing, which was a tremendous success. It was definitely the best weather of the three years that we've had so far. Um, I, again, want to send our appreciation to our foundation, as well as the almost 80 golfers who came out to support the East Penn Education Foundation and ultimately the school district several weeks ago. You may have noticed on our social media that we've been celebrating our outstanding building principals. October is National School Principals Month, and so throughout the month, please take a look at our social media on which we recognize our building leadership team for their tremendous work and dedication to our students and families of the school district. I'm proud to share that, um, and again, we heard a lot about areas in which our school district is excelling. Um, one of those areas is certainly in our visual arts program. And just recently, the Pennsylvania Art Education Association recognized Emmaus High School as an outstanding visual arts community for the school's commitment to visual arts education opportunities for students in grades 9 through 12. Districts and schools that received this endorsement demonstrated the importance of their visual art programs during the previous school year, specifically through rigorous and inclusive programs, highly accessible programs, and highly visible programs. So congratulations to um, our students, our teachers at Emmaus High School for that outstanding accomplishment. We have some exciting upcoming events in the district. Um, this fall, the Emmaus High School Theater Department will present Little Women that will be held September 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Tickets are available on the website. They'll also be available at the door. I encourage you to get your tickets on the website early. Um, as a reminder as well, our senior, citizen, senior citizen gold card holders can present their gold card to receive one complimentary ticket. 
The 2324 East Penn Pride Award Program is also open online for nominations. So if you have a faculty, staff, or volunteer in the district that you would like to recognize and nominate as a possible East Penn Pride Award winner, I encourage you to do so through that online process. And speaking of East Penn Pride Award winners, this Friday at our home football game, we will announce the first employee of the year. And anyone who was an East Penn Pride Award winner from last year was entered into being considered for the East Penn Employee of the Award. And again, we'll give that um, first time award this Friday evening at halftime at the football game. And so we're appreciative of the committee of employees and community members who helped us to make that really tough selection. Action. I'd also highlight that coming up on Thursday, November 2nd, Lehigh Career and Technical Institute, LCTI, will hold its annual fall open house for prospective students and families. That's held from 6 to 8 p.m. We have additional information, including RSVP details that's on our website. Um, I really encourage families, whether you have a student who's in high school, perhaps in middle school and thinking about LCTI, to take the opportunity to go engage in the open house um, just to witness firsthand the amazing opportunities that are available available to our students. And finally, I do appreciate our community member who um, mentioned the school board meeting highlights. I just want to clarify that our school board meetings are live streamed. They, the recording, the full recording is then posted the next day on our East Penn website. And what I actually referenced in my board report is that we were attempting to make things um, perhaps even, even more transparent or put information out there for families. We started something called board highlights. And so after each board meeting, we just take the three um, perhaps topics that we spent the most time on that evening and we give a quick summary and we also give you the timestamp on the video so that you can actually go back and watch that particular segment of the video or you can watch again the entire meeting because we absolutely put the full recording out there. So appreciate the feedback and wanted to clarify that um, that all of that information is readily available for the community. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Are there any? Yes, Ms. Bowman. Um, I, I appreciate you clarifying that because I was actually confused thinking I misunderstood uh, what you were doing last meeting, um, that it's in, in addition to not instead of what we're currently doing. And I think it's wonderful. Um, I, I know there are um, a group of dedicated 100 or 200 or so people who watch our videos. You can tell if you look at each one. But um, there are a lot of people that just don't have time to spend a whole hour or two, or we've gone longer, um, watching all of the videos. So I'm, I'm happy that um, you're putting the highlights and telling people where to find them. Um, my The main reason I wanted to mention a comment, though, was about the arts programming at East Penn, which is phenomenal, as you mentioned. Um, and it really makes me proud that um, not only are we strong in STEM and particularly engineering at the high school, but we also have an incredibly well-developed arts program, um, something that I was, um, you know, witnessed firsthand with a student that was interested in that um, area. Um, what I think is important with the arts is not only do some kids go on um, and use that as a career choice, a college choice after high school, but it also can provide a needed outlet for kids who are really um, overstimulated or burdened by some of their very hard academic subjects. Um, that art class may be the thing that helps them relax a bit so that they um, have what it takes to get through the whole school day with a hard academic load. So uh, anyway, I'm really proud of that programming, proud of our art teachers, um, anybody can go to the art show in the spring to see the caliber of students and what <clears throat> they produce there. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Are there any other comments or questions? Mr. or Dr. Whitney. <clears throat> I'd also, I'd like to echo that and, and congratulations to the art educators at, um, in East Penn who received this recognition, I think rightly so. And of course, it's not just about visual arts, it's about the theater program and the music programs, which are incredibly strong. And I think it's an important reminder that as we continue to talk about improving academic performance and improving academic outcomes and putting a focus on STEM fields uh, and other academic fields that 
there have been many, many hundreds of studies done, uh, and the evidence is out there for anyone who chooses to go and look that a strong arts education component leads to better academic outcomes as a whole, and so and better career outcomes, better career satisfaction. Um, and it's not just for students who go into the arts as a career, it's for students that go into any aspect of their uh, of life. So I just want to point that out and recognize, and again, congratulate the great work that our art educators do in East Penn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whitney. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Campbell, for that report. Uh, moving on, uh, the next uh, item for, on the agenda is personnel. Um, for item A, I have one correction to note uh, on, on personnel agenda exhibit A. Uh, the, advi the advisor for Craft Club, um, Ms. Claire Harvey, is at LMMS, not IR. Uh, and if there are no objections, I'd like to take a motion to uh, uh, approve both items A and B together. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments for the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? <coughs> aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Seven ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. And before moving on, I'd just like to congratulate uh, Dr. Povolitis. Uh, yeah, I guess you're sticking with us for a little while. <laughs> um, Okay, next item on the agenda is business operations. Uh, I'm going to take these items in two separate motions. First motion, uh, items A through E together. Um, I, I have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, are there any comments or questions from the board? Uh, Dr. Whitney? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to get a little more information about the, the PowerSchool plug-in uh, contract. I understand that Behavior reporting is something that already exists and that we're piloting this as a way to determine whether this is a more effective way. But um, could you clarify a little bit as to whether the type of data that would be reported through this particular plugin in PowerSchool would be different than what's currently reported? And also, how, who has access to this data and how is it utilized? Mr. Billman's going to, to come forward to as our Director of Technology. Thank you. Good evening. Um, regarding the Pure Data's uh, plug-in, um, the, um, this, this will provide a way for, um, for us to be able to um, track regarding uh, both positive um, and negative behaviors um, that are um, be able to be tracked in PowerSchool. And um, our, um, the the data will be um, the way it will be accessed by those that uh, are tracking log entries. So that would be specific to the um, the building principal and their team uh, of individuals that um, work with log entries, um, and they will have um, access to that through uh, through the uh, through the plugin. So, admin rights are are given to building principal level employees. Yes, and, and, and also teachers will have the ability through uh, Power Teacher to access and actually put the entries in through through Power Teacher as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Any additional? Oh. If I could just add um, for a moment, um, access to that information will be through the core team in each building, and the core team is that group of individuals who really spearheads our MTSS process. And so that is the data driving decision team in each building. Administrative rights would be limited to certain individuals, such as the principal or members of that core team, depending on the level. And teachers would have the ability to um, input log entries for that referral process, but not necessarily see the entirety of the data that is in there. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to measure whether this is a better use of, or a better system than the current system that we have? So this is a plugin, so it's integrated directly into our student information system at PowerSchool, which will allow us to have real-time data. It will also allow more individuals across the district level to have access to the data. We also see the 
the potential bonus to have the information roll from level to level to level to create the consistency and the standardiz standardization of reporting uh, K through 12. Um, this will allow us to identify trends in the data, both positive and negative, uh, whether it's certain particular groups or time of day or location, and all of that will allow us to be far more targeted in our interventions and supports both at the building level and district wide. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. It clarifies. Okay, thank you for the question and for the answers. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, so assuming the plug-in and the pilot goes well, what is the next kind of step in the process? Where do you see this going, and what expenditure level are you looking at in terms of supporting this kind of uh, system? So I could speak to the vision of where we would like to go if the pilot is successful. So right now the intention, as you um, have seen, is to pilot at, at an elementary school as well as a middle school. Uh, we expect to get feedback throughout the year from those teams that will be presented across district to our leadership teams to evaluate whether or not this is a, um, a program that we would consider long term. Um, the, the value of that would be we're able to customize and standardize across district. And as far as the expenditure of it, I think, Michael, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, so being, the expenditure would be something that we um, take into account regards to as we get feedback, because as we're working through the pilot, we're uh, going to get the feedback in, in real time, um, working with uh, both, um, both the elementary level and the middle school level to get that feedback, and then apply that directly to work regards to the needs and addressing the needs um, for the uh, to go forward. And I think the process would be, again, after the implementation, we would have to look at what we're currently spending on, what we're currently allocating for tracking of discipline, and to determine <clears throat> if it would be an additional budget request that we could bring forward as part of the budget process, and or look if it could be covered through um, perhaps other costs that we had for some tools that we have that are tracking some similar data, not identical. Okay, so you will, will this be part of the upcoming budget cycle or you won't know that until a year from now? We would, we would, be, able to, we would be able to have indication, we would be able to have an idea of where we're at with regards to if it's to Dr. Campbell's point, we would know, we would know in, in, in time for that with regards to our budget priorities. So I just want to explain that a little more detail because as I've shared Safe Schools data with you before, some of the Swiss um, Swiss was something that Laura McCunji was using. And so when we're trying to run and compare behaviors, uh, some of them are paying right now for a program built by building. So there may be the potential for that money that's being paid by building to then just contribute to the overall cost of the sys plugin but we would probably wait the entire year and look at the reports that we can generate based on our safe schools data this year and our positive behavior before we know whether or not we are going to move forward with that for the following year so i'm looking at that in a longer cycle um, in terms of actually replacing some of the costs that buildings are spending right now okay so it's not a it's you don't project it to be a current budget cycle not not to, not for your the springtime very good thank you thank you Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll on items A through E. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Seven ayes. Okay. Final item under um, business operations is item F, school crossing guard resolution. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Seven ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. All right, moving on to curriculum. Uh, first item, item A, educational conferences. Uh, may I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yeah, I had one. Um, there's a conference in here. Doug Spat is going to nonviolent crisis intervention instruction certificate program. Um, I don't have a problem with the conference per se, but I'm just curious why it's uh, almost $4,500. 
is that an, also an application or some uh, cost of applying to the conference or registration? Dr. Mayor Bella, thank you. Oh, this is the so crisis the intervention has, training. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the district has two CPI trainers, and Doug is our Doug is our newest CPI trainer. So he has to go through the entire class instead of a recertification class. So Doug would take that learning, and then Doug is one of our certified trainers that rolls that learning out. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Hey, thank you for that. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Allen, please call the roll. Mr. Jankowski? Aye. Dr. Whitney? Aye. Mrs. Bowen? Aye. Ms. Bowman? Aye. Mr. Bird? Aye. Mr. Champagne? Aye. Dr. Levinson? Aye. Seven ayes. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, next item under curriculum is uh, a new and revised curriculum. Um, Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Yes, we have quite a robust list as well. And so I invite Mr. Mahalik, one of our curriculum supervisors from the Office of Teaching and Learning. He is going to lead the presentation this evening. And while we transition over, I will just share a little bit of background that while Mike <clears throat> is the primary facilitator or presenter of the curriculum. The work that he is presenting is absolutely a collaborative effort of um, many, many teacher leaders from the organization who've helped to revise and or write new these courses. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening. This is uh, tonight you're going to hear nine new courses for different departments. Um, a lot of teachers were, were certainly involved in this. And so i um, happy to share a lot of this. This is, I think, a lot of really good updates, really uh, great things for our students at the high school. Uh, the first two courses that I'll briefly mention are from the business department, um, a change in PFM and entrepreneurship. So Kelly Duffy and Nero and also Kim Fuso were, were very helpful in this. With PFM, this is one of our more popular courses at the high school. And this change is a, a change or proposal in redu uh, reducing it from one credit to 0.5 credits. This decision does not come lightly. It's mainly because so many students want to take this class. Not all of the students get this each and every year. Um, so that I think the last two years, we're averaging a little over 400 students who uh, this is their primary request. So by reducing it from one credit to a half credit, we can give more students an opportunity to take this course because not all of them currently get it. But it's also something that we firmly believe in. We've heard a lot from our community, the value of students learning personal finance before graduation. So this is an opportunity to give more students that opportunity, which also comes with L3C uh, dual credit. So this is uh, a, a great thing, we think, but again, we do not take this lightly because this is a very popular course, the, redu you know, the reduction from one to 0.5 credits. It is manageable to do, to cover all the L3C um, required content in, in the you know, less time. Uh, that's something that the teachers have, have certainly worked through. This also allows other courses, other um, you know, programs within the business department to continue to grow. Um, including field study changes in entrepreneurship as well. So um, that's a little bit about PFM. To give you an overview of what the course might look like, there's been a little bit of, of restructuring. It's pretty neat. The course will kind of mirror almost like a personal budget. Start with behavioral economics, what matters to individuals when it comes to spending your money, and then they're going to get into money coming in, which includes income, checking, savings account, taxes, paychecks, and then money going out, as we all know, all those different expenses that are part of adulting, and then what you do with the remaining money. So uh, when it comes to like spending, investing, and retirement. Uh, but again, uh, really important to know, it's still, even with a reduction in credits, it's still is going to uh, cover all the content with the l um, you know, course content that they provide us, so we can still do dual enrollment. Okay, so that's PFM. For entrepreneurship, there really is no, no change whatsoever. Our course matches their course um, almost identically, so we do not have to make any changes in curriculum to be able to offer this course for dual credit. This really is just our way of being transparent, saying we want to add the dual credit opportunity for kids that are taking entrepreneurship, but there are no curriculum changes. It's more just we want to get that dual credit added to it. Moving on to the art department, Lexi Soboleski and Katie Fenninger were uh, the two teachers that helped write this course. So this is a, a new course. This is um, 
one of the few brand new courses that you're going to be hearing about tonight. It's called Foundations of Art. This is going to be a half credits elective that is an entry level art course for students in grades 9 through 12. This is going to be replacing the 2D and 3D foundation art courses that we had in the past. Both 2D and 3D foundations of art were half credit courses where students would take that before going into level one, two, and three of their desired pathway. So uh, the example that I always go with is drawing and painting. So students would take 2D before going into drawing and painting one, two, and three. So by creating foundations of art, this is going to essentially merge 2D and 3D together we no longer need to offer the 2D foundations and 3D foundations separately. This also allows some, um, some changes in the pathway for students. They can come into the high school and go right into those level one courses. This is important because this then allows them to get to level one, two, and three, and then possibly other advanced level art courses. The teachers felt like there was enough of an overlap between what the students are learning in middle school and what they were previously teaching in the 2D and 3D foundations that it, it really isn't that big of a deal. But by continuing to offer the foundations of art course, it still is that safe entry spot for students interested in art that might not know if they prefer 2D or 3D. So to give you a visual of what the change would look like, it's, it's really just a, an added opportunity for students to get through their pathway, their desired pathway if they know. So on the left-hand side, you can see our current model, which would be in the past students came in, they would take, for instance, 2D art before going into drawing, painting, one, two. And if you look at grade 12, that's where you know things start kind of getting a little complicated with them taking that third level if they wanted to. Um, and I just use an example where maybe like AP Studio Art. So if you look at, to the right, the proposed model over on the far right, we still can have students go into that entry level art course of foundations of, of art. They're gonna get exposure to both 2D and 3D, and then they can choose their level one, two, and three the same way that we have been doing it. So we don't lose that, but we do give kids now the opportunity to come right into the high school, go into that level one, two, three, and that, you know, other advanced level art courses. Next up is stage design. This is a tech ed course, uh, mainly written by Chris Kohler, but Jill Keebler and Steve Braulio were also uh, very helpful and offered a lot of ideas. This is a, a neat course. It's got a collaboration between tech ed and, um, and some of the arts. So this is a, a new course. It's a half credit elective in tech ed, open to students grades 9 through 12. The, the intention of this course is really to give students an opportunity to work with the, the engineering, the design process, but in a way that also covers a technical aspect of theater. So for kids that might be more interested in the arts, but are, are meeting that STEM requirement, this could be of some, of some interest to those students. So really the, the, the main goal here is to teach students those technical skills with the engineering process, but specifically related to the stage. So they're gonna be doing a lot of different things that. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily know what knows what goes into a production, things that we should see, things that we should not see. So we can expect that the students are going to be working on set design, building and painting techniques, uh, props, staging, lighting and sound. Um, it does not require any additional spacing or funding. We have all of that. So this is really just a, a neat idea to give students a new, a new opportunity to engage in the, you know, in the engineering process. Flying through. Now we got math. So for math, uh, Kim Adams, the department chair, uh, was very, uh, very helpful in all this. But all the, the uh, teachers were also reviewing the course content to make sure that this that we did have a lot of good matches. So of the five math courses that uh, I'm going to be sharing tonight, only one of them is new. The other four are more like the LTRIC dual credit. We just want to add that that little stamp onto it. Um, so right now, uh, of those five courses, the the four that we want to just add the dual credit to include probability and statistics, pre-calculus, calculus CP, and advanced topics. At the <laughs> bottom, you can see what equivalent course those count for at LTRIC. So prob stats would be math 150, pre-calc would be math 160, calc CP is business calc or calculus for business majors are students who might be more advanced when it comes to STEM, they might be taking AP calc. Um, or advanced topics, but calculus CP would be more of like calculus for business majors. And then advanced topics, which is what some of our students take if they've already taken AP, Calc AB, or BC, they can then move on to essentially Calc 3. So the new course is called Intermediate Algebra. This will replace a course that we used to teach called Math Analysis. And the goal here, this is a, a pretty neat opportunity. Students who would be taking Intermediate Algebra would essentially spend the fall 
I guess we can say remediating, working on some of their skills, closing some of those gaps, um, using a, a software that LTRIC would, would give to us, would give access to us for, for free. It's called EdReady. Um, the significance of EdReady is this is the LTRIC placement exam for, for students that go on to LTRIC for determining what math course mm -hmm. they place into. So our students would be able to work with that, that software. It, it's it's kind of like iReady in the same way that it's going to be able to put students on a path, help them with those gaps, and then the students would take the placement test. If the students are, are successful taking the placement test, they can then uh, qualify to take the equivalent of Math 105 then in the spring semester. So this would be for students. Um, I, I have a, a visual here to kind of help you understand like you know who, who might this be for. So we have students that come into the high school needing either fundamentals of algebra or algebra one. This might be that senior level option for them. Historically, <clears throat> they never had an opportunity to earn uh, college credit. This now gives them an opportunity to earn college credit if they're successful with the placement test. <coughs> Even worst case scenario, they take this and they're not successful in the placement test. At least we know that at the halfway point of their senior year and not once they've graduated and now they're potentially you know, unsuccessful in a placement test and now they might be paying for a remedial math course. So this would actually give us time to work with those students so that they might be more successful when they make that transition into community college. So overall, big picture, the, uh, this, these changes are, are pretty exciting because we have many different routes that students will, will go through in mathematics at the high school, but now every just about every single pathway could end with an opportunity to earn college credit before graduating. And so in the past we had AP, but now you can see here just some, some common pathways that all those green boxes, these are now dual credit opportunities with LTRIC and the, uh, the blue ones are those AP courses. So really um, in, in terms of mathematics, I think this is pretty exciting that our kids, many kids will have opportunities to earn those college credits before, before graduating. And also just to give you an update on how this all fits, a year ago I was here talking about the, the phase one curriculum changes, which included ALG1, ALG2, geometry, AP pre-calc, prop stats, and applications of algebra. All of those courses were approved a year ago. Right now they're in their first year of implementation. These courses would be part of phase two. The only ones that are not currently being proposed tonight, which we hopefully will get to in the springtime, would be fundamentals of algebra and geometry concepts. But once those are done, those don't have any implications in the program of studies. Once those are done, we have completely rewritten all of our, our high school math courses. So thank you, and I'd like to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. McClock. Uh, Ms. Bowman. Yes, um, thank you so much. Uh, always happy to hear about um, some of the new courses that are coming up. Um, a question about the personal finance class um, going from <coughs> half, is it from half a credit to a quarter credit? One to, one to one half. To half. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you mentioned what's in the class, but what I, I imagine something has to be, something's being left out if you're cutting the class mm -hmm. basically in half. What are they not going to learn? They're, they're going to read, they're going to teach all the LTRIC required content. They just can't go into as much depth as they previously had gone in the past. That's, so when I said before this, this, this decision was not made lightly. We, that's not easy for the, the you know the teachers to to come to grips with, but that is something that's almost we got to weigh the pros and cons. We would really like a lot more students to be able to have this opportunity. And to be honest, if this is something where we realize that there's more out there that we should be teaching our kids, that could be a new course. I might be here next year saying there might be another you know an, another business offering that we've got to be able to add to be able to get to some topics that maybe we weren't able to. But we really do feel like the pros outweigh the the cons in this one. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I do worry a little um, whenever I ask people for suggestions, they always tell me to add personal finance, mm -hmm. and, I, and then I mention that we actually already have it. Um, and, and when you say that it's like one of the more popular classes and how many kids want to take it, it shows that um, there's some word of mouth advertising going on where um, they see the value in it. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that um, by cutting down to half a credit that they're not losing some of the value in that class. Um, okay. And then I was really happy to see what you're doing with stage design. I love when you combine two disciplines, especially for kids who might be struggling to you know, whether it's math or tech ed or whatever it is, um, helping them to, uh, to kind of allow themselves to go in that direction through something else that they might actually love. Um, my question about that one, though, is um, obviously somebody was doing stage design before. How does this change, like, the 
fall and spring productions if now that we have a class doing it like does that change how those are set up to start not really um this is it's we want it to be a sustainable course that's not at the discretion of the fall and the spring you know performances so this will be something that maybe this could lead more interest into those students taking this course they might want to get involved with the actual performances but this isn't going to be a class that's strictly dedicated to building the set for those performances so they'll be building sets, but those sets may not necessarily be being used Correct. for something. But there's also a chance that it could happen, but we don't want it to be completely linked to those performances. OK, that's helpful. Um, in the intermediate algebra question I have, well, I think I know the answer, but I'm just sort of want you to correct me if I'm wrong. So um, when kids take their keystone, they take that after Algebra 1. Like, that's not going to affect mm -hmm. when they take... This is solely about them getting, um, having an opportunity to get some college credit. Is that correct? correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Um, and then the, the last thing, um, just because you're, you're always bringing us, like, really innovative ways to keep kids interested in topics that um, sometimes we're struggling to get kids interested in, especially um, in the STEM area. Um, I, I had the opportunity to see uh, Reynolds Advanced Materials over the weekend, and I know we've done a, a What's So Cool About Manufacturing about that area. Um, and it, it occurred to me that that's a resource that we might be able to find a way to partner with. They're within our district boundaries, and um, to do what they do there, there is some science and math involved and also clearly some art and, like, amazingly cool art I think our kids would find to be. So I just wanted to, to mention that and put, <coughs> just plant the seed for maybe next year you'll be coming back with like, you know, the movie mask making class or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'll so. be back next year. We've got all the new science courses will have to be proposed next year with the new steel standards. So material science is something that has to yeah. come up. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Bowman. Uh, Mr. Jankowski. I just want to commend you for the thoughtfulness in, in these changes and additions. I think, um, you know, this really will appeal to, you know, a broader selection of students and create more opportunities um, for more students based on their, you know, differing needs and, and desires. So, I mean, I, I think these are all great, great changes, uh, great additions. Um, and I think it really does offer a lot more for our students. Um, do you have an adult version of the uh, personal <laughs> finance management that I might? Not yet. <laughs> might be able to just look at, not, you know. Just <laughs> so thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jankowski. Uh, Mr. Bird. I just have one comment also. Uh, please, uh, you did a great job by everybody who worked on the team for the, these changes you're making. I think they proved to be very valuable to the district and all our students. I have one question. As you rewrite the curriculum for math in any, any subject in our district, how are they aligning with the Keystone exams and also the standardized tests? Do you look at those tests and see, can you see what the students have to face and try to prepare them in a curriculum basis? Yeah, uh, yeah. there's a lot of different ways I could go about answering that question. I think um, we know what, when we have, for instance, if we're preparing students for the Algebra Keystone, we know exactly what the different uh, standards are that we need to teach our students. And then when the results come in, we can, you know, examine that data and look to see where exactly we're, you know, where we're doing well and where there are areas that we need to improve on. I think what's, what's neat about, and correct me if I'm not answering your question, but what's neat about, I think, these opportunities is that we have students that come in and they might take Algebra 1 in ninth grade or even 10th grade, and maybe they're basic on the keystone. And usually it, it almost seems right now, unfortunately, that the narrative around those kids that is that they're not successful in math just based on that keystone, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. And now, by inserting these dual credit courses, we now have an opportunity for these kids to have success in mathematics, because they're still moving on. They're still going to be very successful in life, regardless of what that keystone score might show. And so I think this is a really a really neat opportunity to give those kids a head start on, on earning some college credits, regardless of where they might have been with their algebra proficiency in eighth grade, ninth grade, or tenth grade. I think what you just answered my question, that you're building a bridge, which it's actually going to work in favor of our students mm -hmm. for success down the line and yep. not just on the standardized test. Mm -hmm. And thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes. Um, I applaud you for bringing this, you know, dual credit to a lot of these courses now. You know, it's really, you know, I think a, a great opportunity for, for students. I guess one of the things I've wondered, though, is you've got students who don't necessarily 
view themselves as college bound, but they may be bound for technical schools uh, post high school. Is there any arrangement that you can see where their high school credit could be then counted toward credit for some of those schools like the Pennsylvania College of Technology? Is there any, has there been any thought about expanding the dual credit opportunities beyond, you know, the traditional, you know, uh, uh, community college or even a local university? Because you've got a lot of students who obviously look to different courses, different opportunities to major, and a, a, a place like Pennsylvania College of Technology where LCTI sends a number of students would be one of those. So I'm just curious, has that ever crossed your, your desk? Yeah, absolutely. That was the intention behind the, uh, the intermediate algebra and the Math 105. Um, our, our department chair, Kim Adams, she's been, she, she's been really passionate about this one, and, and she's got personal experience in her family of, of the track that, that her son followed. And, and so this really is a course that for students that aren't necessarily, maybe they don't feel like they're traditionally college bound, but they're still going to go on at any kind of, maybe it's a two-year program or, or you know, any other kind of institution. This course should bypass that remedial math course or that foundational math course that they're not earning any credits for that they might make the students take if they're not at that level. So we really did have those students in mind with the intermediate algebra. Okay, but it doesn't necessarily translate to college credit beyond L tri C. Yeah, and in fact for all the dual credit courses with you know the the courses with L tri C credit should transfer to most of our state schools in Pennsylvania. But beyond that it really depends on the, the agreements between L tri C and those other institutions, how that course may or may not transfer over. So we're not looking to broaden our relationship with other institutions for dual credit opportunities? I think we're always looking to broaden and, and add more. If we can find more institutions of higher ed that we can partner with, then we're certainly looking into that. Okay, because that, that, I mean, that would be one thing I would like mm -hmm. to see us think about in the future is are there other institutions beyond L tri C that, you know, you can, like the Pennsylvania College of Technology, I know, you know, co kids can take courses at Lehigh if they're eligible and so forth. But, you know, I think that would be something that I would, you know, ask that you, you take a look at at some point in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Whitney. Yeah. Uh, some great changes. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just a couple of specific questions first. Um, on the foundations of art, so I applaud the impulse to push everything you know up a year um, but it looks like it still sort of everything sort of culminates in the AP studio art class so there's sort of one two three AP uh, given that now we're kind of freeing up that first year or we're kind of pushing the really dedicated students into the level one classes in, in the ninth grade year is there any thought that this might lead to the development of more advanced elective courses for the students that you know, get through one, two, three, or one, two AP, and they're juniors, and then they still have their senior year, and they really want to mm -hmm. dig deeper. Is there <clears throat> potential for that? I think there's potential for that. I also know that there's the immediate, I think, change that we'll see, the benefit to changing the pathway is that there's going to, art is the same way as like tech ed and business, where we have a lot more students that sign up for courses and are able to get it. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the nice things about this change is that it's going to allow more students to get their primary request. So before we start figuring out could there be other advanced level courses? It's really giving kids what they're looking for initially. Okay, great. Yeah, I agree. That's more important. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so the stage design course, which is a former theater professor, warms my heart. I'm very excited to see this one. Um, you said, you mentioned that this could give student credit, uh, I think you said engineering credits or something like that. Could it also be arts and humanities credits or could it be either? Is yeah, this, what I said before, this could um, be in a tech ed course for students that are looking to meet their, their STEM requirement, but I do believe, but someone's going to need to fact check me, I think tech ed also counts for the, art, for the humanities graduation requirement as well. Okay, thanks. Um, and then finally, just the, the PFM course, um, I just have a question, I don't know how... How important is it that we preserve this course as a dual credit course? And the reason I'm asking is because clearly the demand and the, the need is there, and it's clearly a, a fundamental course that many, many students are interested in. And I, I wonder if it's more important to keep it half year as a dual credit course or pie in the sky. Is it a quarter course that then you can double again the number of students that could potentially take it? covers fundamental materials related to personal finance and 
almost, dare I say, maybe is even a requirement for all students, right? I mean, is there, is there again, so I'm asking, like, is it, is it really important that this particular course be preserved as a dual credit course in your mind? I think right now we feel that it is. It's a, it's a very popular course, and, and, um, and a lot of students do. I, I think for a lot of students, this is when they get to learn if, if uh, maybe they have those doubts, can I handle a college course? And this is mm -hmm. one of those that's very popular. It gives kids that, that experience into that college-level course. I also think just from working with the teachers, I, I know their, their um, kind of the reservations with knocking things down even further. And so they also have talked about there's, there's just the – Juniors and seniors get it a little bit more than freshmen and sophomores, even with something as simple as when they're, when you start working and what's even on a paycheck or how's that all even work. So sometimes that well, the reason I bring that up is just because we're, I think we're seeing kids at, in their later years in high school. It means a little bit more to them than it does <clears throat> to students who might be younger. There's more relevance, more immediate relevance. So it's something that I think it, right now it just seems like a good fit, a great opportunity to earn those college credits, but also something that we know is needed for these kids when it comes to the personal finance. It just right now it just seems to be like that's the best decision. Yeah. Thanks. That mm -hmm. helps. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Whitney. Any additional questions? I'd just like to add some comments. Again, you know, I think these are great additions to the EHS curriculum, um, things I probably would have been interested in taking myself. Um, on the personal finance class, uh, what can you, what's the estimate for the annual enrollment in that class? Uh, I, just, I know the last two years we've had more than 400 students requested for their primary. I think this year I'm going to look 12 sections I think we're running this year. Um, so 12 times 28. 30, somewhere in there, and that's that's our enrollment. And that, um, this also does not include the, the secondary requests either. Okay, so that you said that's primarily juniors and seniors, or is that? 10 through 12, but I think primarily juniors okay. and seniors, yeah. So if you were to project what would happen by making it a, a half credit class, do you, you think that we could double the, the contact? Potential? Yeah, it could. I don't know that it's going to double, but it's going to allow it's easier for, for a lot of those students to be able to get mm -hmm. that course fit into their schedule, but okay. this also means that other programs can grow. So field right. study will now have an opportunity to get bigger. Entrepreneurship can have an opportunity to get bigger. Same thing with mm -hmm. marketing school store. So okay. um, we did, even though we, we really believe in PFM and personal finance, we also didn't want to have the entire department be about personal finance. There's a lot of other courses in the business department that we want to continue to offer and see grow. So I can't give you an exact projection, but it just seems to be we'll see more kids be able to take that while allowing the other, cor the other courses and programs an opportunity to Increase as well. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. That sounds like a, a nice uh, complementary effect of doing mm -hmm. this. Um, back to the the L tri C dual dual credit. Um, so, when a student takes one of these dual credit classes, are they automatically enrolled, quote unquote, in L tri C? So that it will generate them generate an L tri C transcript. When yeah, it's not out? automatic. Um, they, I believe, L Tri C. They they come in and they talk to our students and they take them through the enrollment process. But it's it's not an automatic uh, thing. Okay. So if our students decide to take PFM and they get that on their schedule, they're taking PFM. If they want to take the PFM for the dual credit, that's a little bit. That's a, they're going to go through a different procedure than to take that. Okay, but so it's the same section. Same section. So mm -hmm. they, so it's incumbent on the student to to, to make yeah. the application to L Tri C. Yeah. And there's a lot of help and support for those students along the way. Okay. Is there a fee involved with? Mm, I believe L Tri C is thirty dollars a credit. Okay, so affordable. Um, okay, so that will generate. Well, if they do that path, in addition to the high school diploma, they can get an L Tri C transcript, which they can take with them to go to L Tri C or to another school, and, and hopefully that same credit could could get them a little further along. Yep. In that, so all right, so that's that's very good. Um, okay. Actually, my other question was already answered, but again, I, you know, thank you very much. Again, these are great additions, and, and uh, you know, look forward to hearing about uh, interest next year. Thank you. Okay. Um, item C under curriculum is an overview of the Emmaus High School 2425 program of studies. Uh, Dr. Campbell, would you like to introduce? Logical progression. So thank you again, Mr. Mahalik, for really an, an excellent overview of a lot of information. Um, and I and appreciate the hard work of, of 
the department as well as many, many of the high school teachers who were involved in preparing those courses. And so now those courses become part of the Emmaus High School Program of Studies. And so annually, um, we're very fortunate to have Mrs. Gariello join us to provide an overview of the changes. I want to highlight for the community as well as our audience members that the full program of studies, once approved, will be available on the, on the uh, Emmaus High School website. You can go to the Emmaus High School website now and see the current program of studies. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion today from board members just in terms of the breadth of courses that we offer students. And so if for any community members who aren't familiar with the opportunities that our students at Emmaus High School have, I really encourage you to take a look at that document. It's um, pretty amazing in terms of all of the courses from which our students can choose. And so tonight, um, Mrs. Gariello is going to focus really focus our attention on the proposed changes for the upcoming year. So thank you. Thank I'll you. allow you to, to take over. All righty. Good evening. Um, so the document that you have is the proposed changes. It will show the current wording and language, and then it will also show the proposed changes with a strike through and the additions in a different color. Uh, I'll walk you through the document. A lot of them are just small um, wording changes, and Mr. Mahalik has gone over the big curricular changes regarding dual credit and new courses that we're proposing. So at the beginning of the document is just a revised updated message from the principal, and we wanted to include information about our electives, our, um, our extracurricular activities and sports, and information about how many credits would be a minimum to be a full-time student. So that is just an updated letter from, from all of us. After that, um, there, the beginning part of the program of studies is really just an overview of counseling services and general information. A lot of these changes are just date changes from 2023 to 2024. Um, some of the changes are just changing uh, the school, the guidance counselor terminology to school counselor. Um, and we're just trying to clean up our wording. Sometimes students and parents will have questions exactly about what specific wording means. So um, we're just clarifying wording. For instance, rather than listing colleges, nursing, nursing schools, junior colleges, et cetera, we change that to just post-secondary institutions. So a lot of those changes are just small clarifying word um, changes. And that continues to the course selection message to parents, um, changing um, regular counselors to school counselors, and um, again, just little changes. Um, the date of June 2023 is changed to June 2024, and so this is the beginning part portion of the program of studies. And then um, we move to the section about prerequisites and overrides and the drop ad procedure. We're trying to be much more deliberate and, and specific about our wording, the process, and the criteria um, for override requests and drop ad pro the process for drop ad um, for our students. And so we are adding additional information, trying to be incredibly transparent, both on the website and in the program of studies. And then that is just all the additions that we're adding. So now um, we're moving on to standardized testing, uh, the date changes for the SAT, information, as Mr. Mahalik explained, about the dual credit program, changing dual enrollment to the terminology dual credit. And um, we're very excited about what Mr. Mahalik proposed, the opportunity to give our students college experience while in high school. Um, is, is wonderful, and the fact that we can add these dual credit options to so many courses is really exciting. Um, and again, more information about both the Westchester and the LTRIC dual credit. Um, we, the one thing to note is the Westchester dual credit is credit by exam. That is a requirement for Westchester, and so we wanted to make sure that that was clear in our program of studies as well. We updated our language for the Lehigh, uh, for the LCTI Institute. Um, so we just added some clarifying um, 
language, students earn credit for the successful completion of each year of vocational training. All LCTI programs require an application. We wanted to make sure that was clear. And that's the beginning part of the program of studies. The next thing is that we're very excited to be adding our special education programs and some information about what we offer in terms of our special education services, supports, and courses. And so there's a, a description. We are adding this section um, for the special education services and programs. So that is all new information. There's nothing that we're removing or deleting. And there's some definitions there for, for students and parents to understand and families to understand the differences in the different options and levels of support. And then that takes us to our departments. The first department is the art department. And again, as Mike explained, we're trying to add more flexibility, more opportunities, um, and accessibility for our students to take and try out the art classes. And so by changing the, the credits and that foundational um, art class, more students will be able to get into that award-winning and recognized art department, which is very exciting because the art department, very much like Tech Ed and, um, and the PFM course, we have a tremendous outcry for the courses and um, many, many more students requesting the courses than can schedule the courses. And so um, the changes that we've made moving to the half credit and the foundational course, um, the foundation of art course should give the students more opportunities to test out and try those different areas. We've changed some of the prerequisites, and you'll see this throughout the entire book. Uh, we're trying to make the courses more accessible for students, and we have um, adjusted many of the prerequisite scores or prerequisite courses so that more students can take the opportunity and try out some of these courses. And that is the same that you'll see that throughout the entire program of studies book, but definitely you'll see that pointed out in the art department as well. Just um, adding more grades so ninth graders can take more courses before they had been restricted to certain grade levels and then also certain prerequisite grades to, to take the course. So again, again adding more grades uh, to increase accessibility and opportunity for our students. The business department, again, um, some clarifying and reworking of some of the descriptions for our courses. Intro to business, updating that course description, entrepreneurship, updating, we have a new teacher teaching that course this year, and uh, working within the department, they've decided to update um, the course description for entrepreneurship, and um, also the, the uh, personal finance management, the PFM course, very popular. As Mike said, I think we looked up last year, we had 525 requests for PFM. And we certainly couldn't seat all those students. But so by changing it to a half credit course, hopefully a lot more students will take those courses and have the opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to schedule other courses as well within the business department. So we've changed some of the prerequisites um, to say successful completion of a previous course, so successful completion of accounting one before heading into accounting two, rather than a specific grade or a cut score. Um, Driver's education, there are no new courses. The one thing I do want to point out about driver's education is that we are going to move back to um, focusing on in-person instruction. We've been doing a lot of online instruction for driver's ed, and we have found through the collection of data over the past few years, the kids are certainly doing a lot better with the in-person instruction. So we're going to be putting an emphasis. Students will be automatically scheduled into in-person, and um, if their schedule demands the um, the online course, that would have to be worked out with the counselor, but it won't be the automatic default. In terms of the English department, we are rolling up the on-level courses from 9th to 10th grade. Um, so the 10th grade GP course will be eliminated and we will have on-level um, English 10 in addition to the on-level English 9 that we have this year. There are no changes for our English language learners or our EL department. 
Our Family Consumer Science Department, we've added introductions. We wanted to make sure that the program of studies was consistent and that we had an introduction for every department. Some departments had them, some departments didn't. Some departments were very antiquated and, and um, not representative of what we're doing now. So um, we made sure that every department has a new introduction. Family Consumer Science added a new introduction. And for our child development courses in the FCS department, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted that the application um, must be completed by the students in order to participate in that program and that it's found on the website. The math department, I think uh, Mr. Mihalik went through and, and did an excellent overview, but all those new courses and the, uh, where we're denoting the dual enrollment credits, those are all included as well. There are some wording changes you'll see like in programming, there's just a sentence that was removed, um, but the math department primarily is the addition of that one new course and then the dual credit options for the other four. Let's see, the music department had no changes. The science department revised and updated a lot of their descriptions um, and went through and just clarified the courses. They're working through curriculum revisions right now and so they wanted to be more accurate in what the courses are, are um, what they're actually doing in the classes. It had been a while since they had revised just the short blurbs in the program of studies, so they went through and they updated um, a lot of the rewording. Social studies, again, the rolling up of the on-level American Studies two. We have the on-level American Studies one this year. We're rolling up into uh, 10th grade for American Studies two. So that would be the removal of the GP level. Special, special education, um, we're including, in addition to the description of the department, we're including new courses and awarding credit for these courses and describing these courses so all students have the opportunity to see the offerings and understand what they're signing up for. This includes the Hornet Perks Coffee Shop, which focuses on real life skills and um, employability skills and um, math, science, obviously, and English in terms of the work to set up a store, run a store, and interact with customers, and run a little business. So that's the Hornet Perks Coffee Shop. And then the Career Explorations Pathway, you can see um, focusing on functional skill acquisition and uh, career pathways. And then our study skills class is a support class that we're proud to offer at the high school for a credit. And it is um, focused on executive functioning skills and specific needs of the individual students for their other academic courses. And um, so we're adding that to the program of studies. We've had it, we just hadn't had it, we just hadn't included it in the program of studies. The tech ed department a new introduction for the department as well. The stage design course, as you, guys, as you have heard before, is a new addition. The WellFit and Driver's Ed department, no changes. And the World Language department, no changes. Any questions? Okay, thank you for that summary. Uh, questions from the board, Mr. Champagne. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, sure. One is kind of a nit. Um, under the um, school counseling services, you changed it says support students through their mission process for post-secondary institutions, technical schools, military, enlistment, and entering the workforce. But I didn't mm -hmm. see you make the same change in your message to parents. You left it as post-secondary education. You did not include technical education. Uh, you added the military, but did not add, add, add technical education. That so was an omission, and I can certainly include that. Be consistent. With that. Absolutely, and I thank you for pointing that out. My son actually graduated from Penn College that you referenced before, and it, I have a soft spot for that, so that was an omission. I apologize. No, that's fine. Um, under the um, English language arts, uh, 10th grade English yes. description, at the very end of that uh, description, there's a sentence that says, the literary rigor of selections and student work will increase appropriately for a student following a college-bound track. Now, this course is not necessarily for students who are college-bound. It's for a student, uh, you know, it's on level. So I'm just wondering why the reference to 
college bound track is in here when we've taken it and not labeled it a college preparatory course. We want the students to know that this course is applicable to for students and it is appropriate for students who are planning on attending college. So we don't we want to make sure that okay. that, so that is, is all, in that, there. That's the ref, that's the only reason the reference is there. Correct. Okay. And then as you've done with some of the other things up front, you mm -hmm. know, you've highlighted um, you know the course with course withdrawal process, the and, and the overall process for uh, you know selecting courses. I assume that this course catalog will still have the NCAA uh, identifier. Yes. Should there be a discussion or a description of what is that? What is necessary to ensure that students are taking the right courses? to pass the NCAA Clearinghouse? Because I've run into a couple of cases where the students have not, or the parents have not understood that. So should there be a description up front about what is necessary as students think about their post-secondary education if they want to continue to pursue athletics? There is a process, there are requirements that they have to meet in the course selection so that they are qualified to participate. Absolutely. In. And and it's just not in here because nothing is changing. That we just take directly from NCAA. Okay. And so that is included. Okay. So it's already in here. Yes. It's just not any it's, changes. It's up front? Where I think it's in the back. And it is part oh, it's page four. And it's page four. Um, so all the criteria are listed there. But that comes directly from NCAA. Okay. Very good. Thank you. That's yeah. all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Um, Dr. Whitney. Yeah, um, so I have a lot of thoughts, and I think I can sum them all up by s imploring maybe you to think about all of these messages and all of the text that precedes the courses. Well, like, let me put it this way. Um, I see this document, I see this program of studies as pretty important, pretty a pretty uh, well, you know, accessed resource mm -hmm. for, by parents, by, as you say, community members, by students. And I feel like too much of it is written to an audience that I'm not sure, I'm not sure who it's written for. I'm not sure who many of these messages are written to and for, and I'm not sure, in some cases, I'm not even sure how most people would make sense of the language that's here. Okay. It feels too much like terms and conditions, rather than a document that really outlines and shows who we are as a, as a school, as a district. For example, and I'm looking, I know these are just the changes here, but I'm also looking at this year's uh, program of studies. Like, there's a mission, there's mission and, and uh, belief statements at the beginning, but mm -hmm. the portrait of the graduate is not there. That feels like an omission, right? And, and I'm also looking at the, the educational alternatives, like the field study. I, I, don't, I guess I don't see the point of putting anything about field study in there if you're not really putting a statement, if you're just saying go to the website, in other words. I think it should be right there where people can access, this is what field study is, this is who it's for, this is why you would do it. And I think that goes for all of these educational alternatives that, I mean, including this diversified career something. Option. Yeah, occupations. Yep. Um, this course is available during both semesters for detailed information. Talk to your school counselor. That doesn't tell me anything. So I, I guess I would just, I'm, I'm asking, <laughs> requesting um, that there be a really good look taken at who this is written for and who it should be written for. and how people would make sense of it going through. Um, and I also don't see anything in this year's program of studies about that explains dual credit. I know I see it's here. Um, but also then there's course listings that say DC, and I don't see anywhere like just a simple statement that says DC means dual credit. <laughs> like, I mean, most people can infer that, sure. You can assume, but rather than assume, there's no harm in adding something that makes sure everybody that looks at this document can understand everything that's in it. Absolutely, and I agree with you. And if you look online, about midway through the year last year, we posted and um, we had Orly jazz it up, and the, the profile of a graduate is included 
um, in last year's. It's just not in the print version. There's, it's just all online. Um, so we did add, make some of those changes that you are suggesting and try to make it more visually appealing, more interesting, and to, and to make it a little bit more readable. So I agree with you. The old style program of studies that has been produced in the past is, is, um, wordy and tough to get through. And so last year, about halfway through, if you go onto our um, EHS website, we took the exact same language um, and tried to simplify it a little bit so we were true to what you voted on, but we tried to make it a lot more um, visually appealing, interesting to read, and clarified some of the things exactly like you're talking about. Can we get better? Absolutely, and we will. Um, and I appreciate the comments. But take a look at the online version um, that's on our website right now. It's, it's yeah, it's that's a whole actually lot what better. I was just looking at. I was looking at the online version, not the printable version. So, oh, and I don't see the portrait of the graduate. So maybe okay. I'm just missing. It. I mean, okay. I could be not seeing it. Um, and again, uh, one more uh, specific comment is the having a link to Act One Fifty Eight mm -hmm. is, in my mind, not not sufficient to truly outline and make clear what the statewide graduation requirements are. Again, I know we're providing a link so people can go read the act. Who's going to go read a legislative act? And who can make sense of it, right? Sure. Not that many people. So I don't think it I don't think it harms us in any way to say, yes, it's Act 158. Here's a link if you want to read more, but if you don't, here's one, two, three, four. Here are the statewide graduation requirements. Absolutely. And we have all that documentation. We have letters that we've sent home that clearly outline sure. Act and 158. We can put that in the program. But studies. again, I think using this as the important real estate to really put all of that together, even if you're sending it out in other formats, even if you're putting it in other letters, whatever. Absolutely. It should live here as well. You got it. That's Thank you. certainly easy. Appreciate that. Okay. Great feedback, Dr. Whitney. Ms. Bowman. Yes, I also want to thank Dr. Whitney. Um, I thought that was excellent feedback, especially the um, graduation requirements. I, it's a really common question that parents ask, especially my kid um, didn't pass the keystone, can he still graduate? Um, so making that is easy to find and maybe in multiple places because it's a really common question. Um, I just had some follow-ups and also just some high fives for some of these things that you're putting in there that I was really happy to see the coffee shop concept, mm -hmm. um, especially with the great success of Betty and, but I'm not sure. Betty and Bose. Yeah, yeah. In Bethlehem. I love that you're offering that, um, many different ways that that could help the school. Um, and also the study skills class, which was something that I was asking for as a parent. So it's a, it's a little too late for us, but I'm really happy that it's going to help someone. Mm -hmm. My question about that, um, how will you, uh, like, I, I understand that guidance counselors are, are involved in helping kids get into the classes that they need. But um, for something like that, it seems like some kids would be identified as needing that class. And how will that work? Absolutely. So the study skills class would be run through an IEP team decision. Um, in conjunction with the MTSS process. And then our new uh, supervisor of special ed at the high school, Dr. Cullen, is also putting in another very similar MDT, is what it's called, uh, process <laughs> specifically for students with special needs. And so it's a, it's a similar identification process that goes through a lot of data and then try to build in supports. Ultimately, it's an IEP team decision to change a schedule, so that would all have to be approved, but it's nice that we have the offering to support the kids. Okay. And because I think a class like that, unless it's not what I think it is, um, would benefit kids without IEPs as well. Are they able to take it? Currently, we do not have. Currently, this is specifically for students with an IEP. An IEP. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then just to follow up on driver's ed, mm -hmm. uh, just because we have a percentage of students who are going over and above the graduation requirements, mm -hmm. right? They're they're taking. Um, more credits than they need to take. And sometimes what they try to do is take things like driver's ed and well fit over the summer mm -hmm. so that they can have more space in their schedule to take other classes. Um, will they still be able to do that with the change that you made? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, the online option is still available, but rather than the default being the online for most students, that would be the exception for students who need that because of scheduling constraints. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and then I, this is not a new change. This is existing, but I, I had to read this several times to understand what it meant. It's in the opening letter and it's talking about the minimum number 
of mm -hmm. It's in the bulleted part, um, yes. and it says something about 5.25 credits. At first, when I read that, because of where you have the parenthetical, it makes it sound like you need um, 5.25 well-fit credits, but I don't think that's what you no. mean. Um, we can move that to a different location in yeah. the bullet. <laughs> absolutely. And what you mean is they need to take that per year. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I don't know, somewhere else in here, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which page it's on, you changed from saying year long to one credit. And I'm wondering if yes. you want to do that here. It says five full year, or I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, but maybe you want to say five full credit or something instead of full year. OK. Um, and then the, OK, the, my last question is kind of an overall question. And I, I may have asked this last year and the year before. Um, and I apologize. <laughs> I never remember what the answer is. But I'm aware that you have probably several classes in here that are offered, but they're not actually offered. Does that make sense? Like they're, they're approved, but they're never actually offered from year to year. Kids sign up for it, and then they don't get it. Uh, what percentage of courses are in here that are like that? We offer all these courses. Students can sign up for all these courses. Whether they run or not is a, a numbers game. Um, not just for that particular course, but the other courses within the department. So uh, I'll take the example that Mr. Mahalik just used with the PFM. Um, we could have run all day PFM, every, you know, every business teacher teaching that all day, but we chose not to because we wanted to offer entrepreneurship and we wanted to offer the school store. Um, sometimes we have to eliminate courses if there aren't enough course requests or if after the schedule builds, um, because of conflicts with other courses in other departments, students have to make a choice between this course and that course. And if enough students choose to opt out of a course, we wouldn't run that course, but we would fill it in with another class that has high demand. Okay. So all the courses that are in this program of studies will be offered and could run as long as the numbers were, were there to fill it. Okay. Um, I think the example that I was thinking of, and I don't, it may not even, I forgot to check to see if it's here, so forgive me if I'm talking about a course that's not even in the program of studies anymore. But um, I don't believe during my time on the board, intro to creative writing, for example, has ever been offered, but it's always been in the program of studies. And that's what I was wondering, do we have a lot of classes like that where it's sort of like aspirational on our part um, to have it because we'd like to offer it, but we never actually offer it? We certainly have some of those that have been approved, that teachers would love to teach it, but depending on the demands and the numbers in the other courses, it might it might box out that course, or that course didn't have enough course requests to run. Oh, I see. So. OK. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Additional questions or comments? Mr. Bird. I just have a comment, I guess. Basically, thank you for the presentation and what you put together. I guess one thing that I wanted to comment about, you continue to work on the uh, deep tracking or the, uh, the different courses. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that continuation. And I support that 100% because I believe that is the way to go. It's going to challenge not only our students, but also our teachers and the whole district. And I think we'll come out on the other end. I look at this analogy of that. Uh, railroads had tracks. They had many tracks years ago. They found out all those tracks didn't work. Mm -hmm. The product coming out the other end wasn't very good. And most railroads have gone to less tracks. And it's kind of, been very challenging for them. And they come out with a better product. Okay. And then everybody's on receiving it. I think our district will be the same. Thank, Thank you, you very much. The teachers are working hard and trying all kinds of great new things to, to try to help the students and be successful. I'm very proud of what the teachers have been working on this year. One other question I asked Mr. Mahawk, the same question. As you develop the curriculum, how does that drive uh, the keystone uh, performance of our students, uh, the curriculum that you currently have, or what you think we, we, should, we should be as far as our results on the standardized test? Absolutely. So we, we, ha we can't ignore that. That is certainly part of how we all are being evaluated, the school, the teachers, the students, graduation requirements. But it's not the end-all, be-all. There's a lot more out there to learn. So while we have to take that into account and while the curriculum writing is happening, it's certainly you know, front and center, but it's not everything. Um, there's a, that's the minimum, and we hope and plan to provide more than just the minimum to our students. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Any additional comments or questions? 
Okay, so um, again, I'd like to express my appreciation for the hard work that goes into developing this every year. Um, you know, in my five years, you know, the, it seems like the program of studies just continually improves and, and creates kind of, you know, more detail and certainly supports the, uh, you know, the students and the parents and, and, and the families in the community understanding what it is we do here in the high school. Um, so I like the added introductory material and the general content and, and, and initial process details so people understand what's expected of them as they move through the program. Um, so you know, the refinements that from last year to this year are certainly appreciated. Uh, I do think that uh, you know we got some good feedback like from Dr. Whitney about looking at ways that we could further enhance what's in there. Um, I did have one thing. I know that I asked this you know, some years ago. Um, has there ever been any interest in an American Sign Language course? You know, it comes up, I know it's come up in a, a couple of the schools that I've worked at too. Um, I know there's interest. I don't know the, I know, I don't know how much interest. Um, but I have heard of, I've, I've periodically that it pops up. Yeah. Um, there yeah, wasn't no a discussion about that this year though, during the program of studies development. Yeah, I know it probably comes down to you need to qualify teacher and yeah. you have the interest in all the other stuff. I don't know if there's a way to you know, create a mini course or, or, or something there. Because I, I, I have spoken to people who do have that interest. I don't know if there's a way to integrate it into the mm -hmm. curriculum somehow. Club, credit, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, you know, again, uh, nice work and, and I look forward to uh, um, you know, the continued refinements as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just wanted to wrap up and reiterate um, what many board members have also said just in terms of the appreciation for the work that goes into the document. I want to recommend, I want to recognize as well um, Mrs. Gamble, who's who's kind of hiding back there, but she certainly does a tremendous amount of work yes. um, compiling the program of studies. Um, and I know that our department chairs and the teachers in our departments also um, give us great feedback as we are looking to continually improve the course offerings that we have for the for our students at Emmaus High School. So, you know, you do a great job providing a high level overview and taking something that really is just a, like a mammoth task um, and succinctly presenting and sharing it with us. So thank you again to you and your team. <laughs> our pleasure. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on out to other educational entities. Uh, I believe we have a report, bless you, we have a report on the CLIU from Dr. Whitney. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. <clears throat> uh, CLIU Board of Directors met on Monday, September 18th. Um, just a few items of business, so I'll go through fairly quickly. Uh, we got a, a presentation on the Annie Sullivan Award winner. This is a, an annual award that honors one employee of the CLIU. Um, it's a highly prestigious award. Uh, exemplifies care and involvement with students. Uh, this year's recipient was uh, Emily Zapula, a school psychologist uh, who was recognized for standout positive attitude, good humor, flexibility, tireless work. She works with students uh, across four different school districts in the IU. Uh, so congratulations to her. Uh, we got an update on the extended school year program, which uh, runs through the month of July, essentially, and is to prevent learning regression among some students in the summer months. And it served this year 214 students at six different locations, took, uh, uh, were able to participate in the extended school year program. And so that's a lot of faculty and staff who continue to work during the summer uh, to help those students stay up to speed so that when the actual school year starts, they can uh, jump right in. And uh, then new executive director, Dr. Gregory Coons, uh, discussed the CLIU's 23-24 organizational goals. Uh, there are four of them. Um, first one is collaboration. They are trying to be a little more collaborative between internal and external stakeholders, um, including superintendents and, um, and staff and, uh, and families. Uh, communication is the second. Uh, more robust social media presence. Also, better communication between board members, superintendents, administrative staff, staff members, et cetera. Um, they've already started providing, which I think is personally is a great thing. Uh, after board meetings, they're sending out a, a uh, almost a highlights package to the board members um, ourselves, which is uh, really useful just to remember what was discussed and, and uh, get a review. Third goal, service and commitment. And the fourth goal is quality and economy to um, including more precision in the budget. Uh, 
really making sure that all expenditures are in alignment with the CLIU mission. Uh, and those are the goals that uh, we will hold him to. So that is my report. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Whitney. Any questions or comments? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we not also uh, have a report on uh, from LCTI. Uh, Mr. Champagne. Yes, thank you. Uh, the LCTI Joint Operating Committee met uh, last Wednesday, um, well, not, uh, I guess Wednesday, September 27th. Um, the administrative team gave an update on a number of areas. Uh, Dr. Greenwald reported on the ongoing work for System of Continuous Improvement Initiatives with focus on five key areas, which will be continually reviewed throughout the year. The, the areas are stakeholder engagement, organizational culture of achievement, operational ex excellence, safety and well-being, and staff and student experience. So we'll see updates on those, the goals that are being developed uh, internally, uh, so will the superintendents uh, uh, in their meetings. We also had an update on the enrollment uh, from uh, uh, Sean Will. Uh, the enrollment for 23-24 uh, as of uh, September 9th is 2,353 students, which is up a approximately 200. Uh, East Penn's enrollment is 327 students. I don't know the delta, but it, I think it is an increase. The areas that are highly uh, sought after by East Penn students are the building trades, cosmetology, welding, and electrical technology. Uh, Dr. Van Norman, uh, head of uh, CTE programs, uh, also talked about the Skills USA uh, kickoff meeting for students. It's something that they do every year to kind of in, introduce students who are, are new to LCTI to Skills USA and the benefits. And they also talked about the district competition scheduled for early Jan or for late January next year. Uh, there were also two awards that were given uh, by Dr. Greenwald. Uh, these are awards are something that had been done in the past, but we're kind of re uh, refreshing them. It's called the LCTI Friends of CTE. And the two recipients were Mr. Robert Spangler, who was the superintendent of record till very recently from Catasauqua, and then Mr. Ron Jordan of Jordan Construction. He chairs the Skills USA Council. Uh, sorry to say, we lost one of our key members of the uh, team up there, Wendy Harris, who is director of post secondary and workforce development, resigned to take another opportunity. So we'll be looking to replace her. She was a very integral part of the team, and she really did some great work on the post-secondary and workforce development uh, programs. Um, we also approve the uh, K through 12 guidance plan for 20, that uh, runs through 2024 to 2027 as required by PDE following uh, public comments. Um, the continuation of the community eligibility provision uh, program, which serves students a uh, free breakfast and lunch. We're currently serving about 600 students, and that was uh, a highlight. And then uh, as uh, Dr. Um, Campbell mentioned the open house is going to be held on Thursday, November 2nd. Uh, there will be mailers going out to 12,000 7th, 8th, and 9th graders throughout the uh, uh, Lehigh County. And students and, or parents at RSVP can get a free LCTI t-shirt and also re uh, enter the I iPad drawing raffle. Uh, and that is my report. All right. Thank you, Mr. Champagne. Any comments or questions? Mr. Bird. So one comment, I think the uh, open house is a great opportunity for parents and students who have not seen the facility. It's a great night, and uh, if you can attend, uh, please uh, take advantage of it. And get there early, because it's, yeah. it, if, if <laughs> yeah. your parking, parking is tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe park on 309. Yes. <laughs> please right. attend. Yes, very good event and good advice, too. Um, okay, thank you for, for your report, Mr. Champagne. Uh, moving on, there are no other items. Uh, so on to announcements. Uh, we had an executive session this evening where we talked about litigation, personnel, negotiations, and confidential matters. Uh, our next regular board meeting is scheduled for Monday, October 23rd, 2023. However, the time is going to start at 6.30 p.m., not 7.30 p.m. So again, 6.30 p.m. start time. Uh, this adjustment is for this meeting only, uh, given the anticipated content for that meeting. Um, with no further business, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed?